It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, at midnight tonight, this government will oversee the closure of the emergency room in Minden. Against the outcry from more than 24,000 people who signed petitions to keep it open, against local families, seniors, kids' summer camps, against the local businesses, the business owners who feel let down, ignored by this Conservative government and who are understandably worried about what this means when a loved one has a heart attack, a stroke, or an injury that requires emergency care. Distressed, furious residents, shuttered emergency rooms, no health care when you need it. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, is this the kind of legacy the Conservatives want to leave? To respond, the Deputy Premier, the Minister of Health. Thank you. You know, I will reiterate again that it is incredibly challenging for local leadership to make these decisions because they want to ensure that there is capacity within the system. The Halliburton Highlands leadership have made a determination that it is safer for the community to have cons consolidated two emergency departments into one at the Halliburton site. But, you know, the member opposite talks about legacy, and I want to talk about the legacy that we are leaving future Ontarians when we expand two new medical schools in the province of Ontario, in Scarborough, and in Brampton. I want to talk about a legacy for the first time ever. We have worked with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario to ensure that individuals who practice medicine in UK, in Ireland, in Australia, Response. in the US, are getting their licenses expedited because of the work that we're doing with Bill 60. I want to talk about... Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, in a statement to local media yesterday, the Minister of Health insisted that the closure of the Minden emergency room is, and I want to quote her here, not a closure. Speaker, I was in Minden on Thursday, where the local hospital board has stationed a giant sign that reads, Emergency Department Closed on June 1st. Let me tell you, the closure of the emergency department is effectively the closure of the hospital. The people of Minden know that, and so does this minister. The same government statement goes on to say that the Conservative MPP for Minden has been in touch with the local hospital board, but residents and local business owners here yesterday says she hasn't met with them. And when they were here yesterday, she didn't even raise her head to look at them. Speaker. Why is this government trying to play people for fools instead of taking some responsibility? Order. Minister of Health. You know, Speaker, I choose to believe that the leader of the NDP understands that hospitals are more than just an emergency department, that Minden Hospital will continue to offer services to their communities. The consolidation of the emergency department, while challenging for that leadership, is part of Order. those determinations that the leadership have made. And Order. again, I will go back to legacy. You know, we talk about Bill 60, and as of right, first in Canada, Speaker, that ensures that clinicians who have licenses in other Canadian jurisdictions can today begin working in the province of Ontario as they go through that license process here in Ontario. Those are the legacies that will ensure that we have health care capacity and health human resource capacity in decades and future generations. Thank you. The final supplementary. I'll tell you that's cold comfort for the people of Minden. I'll tell you another thing. A diagnostic machine and a doctor's office does not a hospital make. Lanark County. Guelph, Hamilton, Perth, Grand River in Kitchener, Windsor, Alexandria, Wingham, Thessalon, Kempville, Seaforth, Ottawa, Bowmanville, Clinton, Orangeville, Carlton Place, Essex County, Kingston, Waterloo, Credit Valley, Minden, Smith Falls, London, Chesley, Port Colborne, Fort Erie. All communities that have seen either no ambulances available or the closure Order. of services at some point in the last year because of this government's staffing crisis. 
expert after expert have warned the Conservative plan is only going to make it worse. 380,000 Ontarians just made their voices clear in the Order. OHC citizen referendum. Back to the Premier. Will he listen to experts and uh, Ontarians and keep the hospital open and stop their plan for two-tier health care in this province? Minister of Health. Thank you. I want to remind the member opposite that the president of the Ontario Hospital Association said, and I quote, we're rushing to make up for lost time, and the government has implemented a wide range of well-designed and very constructive programs to recruit and retrain. And some of those programs, of course, Order. include the 911 models of care that ensure paramedics have the ability to quickly assess and make sure that individuals go to the most appropriate place. The dedicated offload nursing program that is in hospitals today, in emergency rooms, to make sure, again, paramedics can release their patients and get back out on the road. The emergency department peer-to-peer, -peer, the emergency department locum program, the extern program, the nurse per preceptors program, all of these programs are available to Ontario hospitals, and we have worked Order. very closely to Response. ensure that when it is appropriate, we will be there and we will keep making those programs available. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario is a place that celebrates and draws strength from our diversity. But across the, cli uh, the province, a uh, climate of fear is taking hold among to us LGBTQ plus people as they face increasing threats and hostility from increasingly organized extremist groups. This is manifesting in local municipalities who are banning pride flags and events and in school boards like the York Catholic District School Board who decided this week to not allow the flag to be flown outside of schools. Yesterday when the Premier was asked whether or not he agreed with the board's decision, he said, and I quote, I have no comment on that. Given the very real and growing hate facing Ontario's LGBTQ communities, does this Premier really have nothing to say on this? Premier. Mr. Speaker, Pride is a special time for us to recognize and celebrate Ontario's LGBTQ plus community. And I've proved it by going into the York uh, Pride Parade, and I'm going to be going again this year. School boards have a responsibility to ensure each and every school in Ontario is a safe and inclusive space for all children. And I'll always support Ontario's LGBTQ plus community. And I look forward again for my third or fourth year going down to the York Pride Parade. And uh, we're going to go down there. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have fun. And uh, that's where I stand. And I think the Leader of the Opposition knows that. Question, the Senate. are important, but only effective when followed by real action. During Pride Month, rainbow flags we raised across Queen's Park, City Halls, and many Order. other public buildings, but not at the York Catholic District School Board, as six trustees voted against the rainbow flag. Yesterday, the Minister of Education offered empty words when asked about how he would keep students safe. Hours later, he issued a memo to school boards without even mentioning the rainbow flag. Speaker, what will this Conservative government actually do to protect students? I would offer him one suggestion. He can issue a ministerial directive to the school boards to ensure that the rainbow flags are flown at every single publicly funded school in Ontario. Thank you. Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We believe that all children in Ontario, irrespective of their faith or heritage, sexual orientation or gender, their colour of skin, they deserve to feel safe in a publicly funded school. And, Mr. Speaker, yes, we have expressed disappointment with the school board's decision, and we have affirmed through a memo just yesterday setting out a clear expectation that all publicly funded schools, English and French, Catholic and public, that they will find meaningful, positive ways to celebrate pride. That is our expectation. And we will be, as a government led by our Premier, visible 
active, present at York's Pride Parade, as we have done for now three or four years, standing in solidarity with the community that, yes, has faced disproportionate levels of violence and bullying. We stand with these kids. We know they exist, Spons. and we are going to ensure they are safe with Ontario's publicly funded schools. Speaker, thank you. The minister talks about marching in one pride. There are 60 pride parades happening in Ontario, with the largest one actually in Order. the city of Order. The largest Order. one being in the city. Stop the clock. <laughs> Member for Toronto Centre made a statement. It was completely parliamentary. Start the clock. Member for Toronto Centre has the floor. Thank you, Speaker. The largest pride parade in the world is actually in the city of Toronto. And where, this is where we actually see security insurance costs for this organization and prides across Ontario going up largely due to the risk of, of violence and threats from right-wing ring, um, extremists. Yet the government is cutting, cutting funding to Pride organizations. Pride Toronto received $250,000 in, 2020, in 2021, $170,000 less in 2022, and this year they were capped at $125,000 with half the money that they received just two years ago. Ipsos has reported that Pride Toronto contributes $589 million to Ontario's GDP and $37 million in direct provincial tax revenues just last year alone. Question. These cuts couldn't have come at the worst time. If you want to show up to march in the Pride Parade, I suggest you show up with a check. Will the Premier reinstate their funding this year? Members, will please take their seat. Remind members to make their comments through the chair. To reply for the government, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, as mentioned earlier in, in a number of times, we are proud to support Pride Toronto and work towards that celebration to support L, uh, 2S LBTQI plus community and, and support what they are attempting to do. And this Pride Festival is so very important. Now, we've had, we've had two meetings with organizing committee at the Pride Festival about a month ago. This is the first time we've really heard of a problem with financing. So I would like to offer when this event is over and we can settle down and sit down and talk about exactly what the concerns are if, if uh, insurance costs have come up and, and they've, other things are happening. It would be nice if we could know about it to show how we could show our support versus a couple of days before the festival is about to start. Mr. Sure. Speaker, we take this seriously, and we do show support through Reconnect Spons. Festival, uh, Event Program Ontario, Cultural Attraction Funds. So it's not as if we've been dis. Take your seat. <laughs> the government house leader will withdraw his unparliamentary comment. John, thank you. Start the clock. The next question. Member for Ottawa Centre. Speaker. Speaker, for profit healthcare staffing agencies are hurting our hospitals. One of these firms is Canadian Health Labs. This company has convinced hundreds of burned out nurses and PSWs to leave their workplaces, offering them double the salaries they normally earn. Their head lobbyist is former Prime Minister Paul Martin. The company made $154 million from 500 nurses and PSWs they've hired out of our public health care systems and public workplaces. Their plan, Speaker, is to hire as many as 5,000 people. Can the Minister of Health confirm if she has met with this company and contracted Canadian Health Labs to work in Ontario? Great question. To reply, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Oh, I just need some confirmation from the member opposite. He is suggesting that registered nurses in the province of Ontario should not have a choice in where they work <laughs> or where, in, which they, in which areas they work. You know, we have, as a government, made a commitment and put money Order. on the table to ensure that we have the largest expansion of nurses in the province of Ontario. It is unprecedented. You know, when the 
Minister of Colleges and Universities and myself visited. Stop the clock. Member for Kitchener Conestoga will come to order. Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Say it out loud, sir. Everyone can hear you. The member for Kitchener Conestoga is warned. Who had the floor? Okay, thank you. Start the clock, Minister of Health. 12,000 new nurses are registered to work in the province of Ontario just last year. Why? Because we are making the investment, because we have directed the College of Nurses of Ontario to say when those internationally educated practitioners want to work and practice in the province of Ontario, you need to expedite the review and ultimately license when appropriate. We've done Spons. that work to ensure that we have removed every red tape barrier that is ensuring people get to practice and work wherever. Supplementary. Member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Let me help the Minister. She has met with the staffing agency Canadian Health Lab six times since becoming Minister. Fly-by-night staffing agencies are hurting our hospital. They are hurting the patient in our hospital. They exist for one reason, to make money for the investor. They take health care workers from our public system and sell them back at huge profit. How big, Speaker? A whistleblower showed us $154 million profit off of the back of 500 Ontarian health care workers. Let that sink in, Speaker. Let that sink in. This is sickening. Why is this minister letting this happen? It would be helpful for the member opposite to also list the number of hospitals that I have visited since becoming the Minister of Health. You know, we learn Order. from what is happening in the field directly Order. with the people impacted. And I can tell you, when I talk to nurses, when I talk to physicians, when I talk to hospital CEOs, they are very, very happy that we are actually making investments to ensure that we have programs like the Learn and Stay program, a program that actually means if you are ready and wanting to stay in an underserviced area, we will cover your tuition and your book costs. And in fact, in Owen Sound, when we when together the Minister of Colleges and University and I spoke to that hospital, every single one of those Georgian College nursing students have applied and are part of that program. It is working. Speaker, and we will continue to make those investments. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Ontario holds immense potential for entrepreneurs and businesses in the advanced manufacturing sector. Our province offers a highly skilled workforce and abundant opportunities, making it an ideal location to establish and expand business operations. Yet, to stay ahead of their competition, our businesses and entrepreneurs want to know that our government is committed to helping their businesses invest in the latest technologies and the best talent. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is supporting businesses, particularly manufacturers, in the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The cost of business by $8 billion every single year. We have made Ontario the most competitive place to invest and grow. This is the case all across the province, including in our rural and regional communities. SBS Drive Tech in Barrie recently announced a $2 million investment in their auto parts manufacturing plant. Now, their facility makes components for both combustion and EVs. And with a $300,000 investment from our government, they will fully automate their manufacturing process on their assembly line and create new jobs. Speaker, SBS Drive Tech adds to the over $1 billion investments and the 1,800 jobs created through our regional development programs, and it builds on the $25 billion in EV investments we've attracted Spons. to Ontario. 
Supplementary question. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that response. It's encouraging to hear that our government is not overlooking workers and businesses, unlike the previous Liberal government. Undoubtedly, programs like the Regional, regional Development Program are vital in driving our province's economy by empowering businesses to invest. However, in addition to attracting international investments, it is crucial that we create favourable conditions for our local businesses and entrepreneurs to thrive within our communities. Speaker, can the minister please provide further details on how our government is supporting local businesses and entrepreneurs to expand their ventures? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Our government has reversed decades of economic harm caused by the Liberals and the NDPs. Their policies cost the province hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs, and, Speaker, it stifled investment here in Ontario. Instead, we listened to the businesses and to the entrepreneurs who told us exactly what they needed to succeed. Lower hydro costs, lower taxes, less red tape. That's what they needed, Speaker, and that's exactly what we did. It simply changed the trajectory of the previous government. And now our world-class innovation sector is making investments and have created 660,000 jobs since we were elected, Speaker. So now, more than ever, entrepreneurs are turning their Response. dreams into success stories. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour, Speaker. Earlier this month, the No Joan Support Network, a worker support network in Brampton, wrote to the Minister to highlight how investigations and enforcement of wage theft complaints to the Ministry are dramatically down under this government. They have asked the Minister to reply by June 1st to set up a meeting to discuss this important issue. Will the minister agree to meet with the network to learn of their concerns? Minister of Labour, Training, Immigration, Skills Development. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the laws are, are clear in this province, and we expect uh, every employer, uh, Speaker, to abide uh, by those laws. That's why, uh, Mr. Speaker, I've been uh, very clear that uh, breaking the law in Ontario can never be the cost of doing business. That's why. In our Working for Workers legislation, we've increased uh, health and safety fines for companies that break the rules. Uh, we're cracking down on temporary help uh, agencies, Mr. Speaker, to be the first uh, government in the province to set up uh, licensing uh, uh, for companies uh, in the province that use temp help uh, workers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm really proud that we announced um, last week that for the first time we're recognizing international credentials uh, here in the province of Ontario for those newcomers that come uh, to our province that have been educated elsewhere around the world that we're moving uh, to recognize those credentials by eliminating the Canadian work experience requirements. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue every single day working for all workers in this province. Supplementary question. Oversight and enforcement by this ministry is the problem. Yes. This this information comes directly from the ministry, the result of a freedom of information request. In 2014, there were 18,000 employment standards investigation. In 2021, that number dropped to 8,000. And Speaker, I want to quote the letter, actually, which uh, the workers who, whose wage, uh, wages are being stolen regard the ministry as weak and ineffective an institution that cannot enforce the orders it issues and that will prosecute employers who ignore the orders. Some employers are so carefree towards the ministry that they mockingly encourage their workers to file employment standards claims, believing they will never face serious consequences, even if those claims are successful. Speaker, does the minister think it's acceptable that Question. millions of dollars, actually $9 million, owed to workers in Brampton and elsewhere in the last year had been pocketed by greedy employers? <laughs> Mr. Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, uh, employers know uh, the laws uh, in this province, and the Ministry of Labour will ensure that those laws are upheld. But it was under a progressive Conservative government, under Premier Ford, that we increased the number of inspectors in this province to the highest in Ontario history. Mr. Speaker, we now have over 500 inspectors Order. inspecting 
thousands of, of businesses, including 200 employment standards officers, officers, Mr. Speaker. In fact, in the last five years alone, we've recuperated over $110 million in lost wages for workers across this province. We're going to continue to work every single day for all workers in this province. Next question, the member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. As we approach the summer season, many people are looking forward to visiting some of our province's top tourism destination, such as Niagara Falls. However, connecting to the Niagara region by car from the other areas in Ontario can be challenging. Traffic congestion and gridlock on highway can lead to delay and frustration. With so much to see, do and enjoy in the Niagara region. There are need to be more options for convenient travel to this part of our province. Tourism is a vital to Ontario economy and our government must do all that we can to encourage more people to visit Niagara. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain what step our government is taking to make it easier to travel to the Niagara region? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank you, the member. I thank the member for the question. After over a decade of Liberal inaction, it is our progressive Conservative government that is investing in the Niagara region to unlock its full potential. Earlier this month, I joined Premier Ford and my colleagues to announce more GO Train service between Union Station and Niagara Falls. The expansion of GO Train service will connect more people to jobs, housing, and to Canada's top tourist destination. And families across the GTA now have more options to get to the Niagara region as GO Train service has increased by two daily round trips and an additional round trip on weekends. Speaker, that's a total of 21 round trips per week. So whether you're heading to a winery in Niagara on the lake or seeing the falls up close, families have more access to GO Transit to explore the beautiful Response. Niagara region. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for that response. The expansion of GO train service between downtown Toronto and the Niagara region not only supports tourism, it also increases travel options for people that live in areas such as Hamilton and Burlington. It is encouraging to see that our government is taking action to increase transit options that will make travel more convenient and will increase opportunity for job and economic growth. It is a vital that our government is continue to focus on measures that will help to advance economic prosperity for Ontario. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is expanding public transit across our province? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my colleague is correct. Ontario's population is rapidly growing, and unlike the previous Liberal government, we are taking action. By 2055, Go Rail will become one of the busiest railways anywhere in North America, with more than 200 million annual riders. And that's why we're taking steps that will support our future. Speaker, the additional Go Train service means trains will also resume service to St. Catharines via station. Our government is also funding four additional weekday express trains during the busiest hours. Trains will travel in both directions on Lakeshore West and offer more express service between Hamilton, Burlington, and Toronto. Speaker, this investment will not only shorten travel times for everyday commuters, but it also supports tourism and economic growth. And with the $15 weekend travel pass, Response. families can enjoy unlimited travel anywhere on the GO Train network. Speaker, our government is making it easier to get where you need to go, and we will continue to invest in Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Centre. My question is to the Premier. May 29th marked the start of National Accessibility Week. The week is ending, and there's little to celebrate by way of accessibility here in the province. Over the last few years, we've seen announcements, ideas, 
and ideas around accessibility, but no real change to meet the markers around physical infrastructure. On top of this, disabled people can't find accessible places to live, are excluded from schools, and are being kicked off of specialized transit services like Wheeltrans, and are disproportionately criminalized. They're also still living on social assistance rates below the poverty line. When will this government stop treating disabled people in this province like second-class citizens and get back to making Ontario accessible by 2025? To respond, the parliamentary assistant, member for Richmond Hill. Thank you to the member opposite for asking this very important question. National Accessibility Awareness Week is very important to this government and to me personally. Mr. Speaker, there is no better advocate for accessibility than this Premier and Minister for Accessibility. They understand accessibility and inclusion requires long-term vision. Every dollar on infrastructure is a dollar being invested for people with disabilities. And I would also like to thank the leadership of Minister of Labor. Just this morning, we announced over $4 million in the Skills Development Fund. Wow. This marvelous fund will support local organizations like Canadian National Institute for Blind and the Geneva Autism Center. Response. This makes sure people with disabilities have the right programs and right services to find meaningful training jobs. When we break down the barriers in our province, we're helping all Ontarians live in a better Ontario. Thank you. A supplementary question. Again to the Premier. This government's focus on employment for disabled people ignores the fact that 23% of the province is disabled and many disabled people will never be able to work. Speaker, the worth of a person exists outside of their ability to produce. And in this province, disabled people can't access public transit, free and fully funded health care, accessible housing, or live lives free of discrimination. As a sitting MPP, I also have struggled with getting trapped in places in Toronto due to inaccessible subways. Enough is enough, and we are people too. When will this Government honor the legacy of David Only and get back to making Ontario accessible by 2025. As we say, we are working on this and we are having special fund to do the training for them as well. Every dollar of the historic $60 billion investment into transit is being invested for people with disabilities. Every dollar that the Premier and this government is spending on building Ontario is a dollar spending on making this province more accessible. Mr. Speaker, project by project, community by community, we are making Ontario more accessible every day. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Van Lee. Thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Access to health care professionals has, has become increasingly challenging for many Ontarians, which is also impacting people on the Ontario Disability Support Program. ODSP recipients have been contacting my office consistently, seeking assistance in finding a doctor to fill out essential forms. These forms are necessary for their special diet needs and to review their eligibility for benefits. The inability to obtain these forms puts them at risk of losing income, support and benefits. Is the minister willing to commit to a temporary pause on medical eligibility reviews and provide extension to recipients who are unable to find a healthcare professional to fill out their medical forms until more healthcare professionals become available? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question because it is a very important one to make sure that we have primary care access across Ontario, which is why in our Your Health Plan and under Bill 60, we've actually set aside an expansion of 18 new primary care practitioner-led clinics. 
today, right now, of course, as an MPP and an advocate, I would hope that you are also encouraging individuals to seek out those community health centres that are um, uh, cited in communities across Ontario to make sure that individuals who need those very important paperwork filled out by their primary care practitioner have that option. There are a number of investments that we have made, but I would hope that as an advocate, you would make sure that you talk about and share what is already there and, and primarily community health centres are a perfect example of that service. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you. I appreciate the answer, but in my writing, there is not sufficient access to a health care professional. That's a fact. Speaker, the province recently announced that it is investing to help people with disabilities find meaningful jobs with businesses in their communities. That's undoubtedly great. However, it is important to consider that many of these individuals will likely need accommodations to successfully integrate into the labor market. The duty to accommodate under the Ontario Human Rights Code specifically requires that the person with disability provides to the employer information about relevant restrictions or limitations, including information from healthcare professionals. Given these requirements, how are they supposed to meet this obligation without access to a medical professional? What is the minister's plan to effectively remove barriers Order. to employment for people with disabilities? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank my honourable colleague for the very important question. Mr. Speaker, my colleague alluded to the investments that we're making, to making sure that every single Ontarian succeeds and thrives in the province, Mr. Speaker. That means every single person across the province, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you through journey to belonging, our long-term vision for a province where every single person, those with disabilities, have a chance to not just succeed and thrive, but make contributions in their communities, Mr. Speaker. That means access to an employment, thanks to the Minister of Labour Training, Mr. Speaker, doing a great work to making sure we connect those with disabilities across the province to employment. Why, Mr. Speaker? Because they belong in their communities. They're contributing members, and we want to make sure not only they do that, but they, they help us with the jobs that are not being filled and, as a result, have a higher income across the province. So I urge the member across and Spons. my colleagues at, at the NDP to support us in initiatives when we say help us so that not a single person is left behind in this yeah. province. That's our vision. Thank you very much. Next question, member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development and, Indig and Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, the ongoing impact of global high interest rates and inflation continues to create challenges for all Ontarians. Unfortunately, the, economic, uh, the current economic climate is impacting people of rural, remote and northern communities at far greater than other parts of the province. Communities in northern Ontario are facing unique barriers for job creation and business development. Sadly, the previous Liberal government ignored the economic potential in rural, remote and, and Indigenous communities and drove many jobs out of the North. Jeez. It is vitally important that our government takes action to keep the North competitive and improve the quality of life for Northern Ontario residents. Yeah. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting prosperity and opportunity in the North? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington for his work here in the legislature on behalf of his constituents. It was a beautiful, sunny, bright day in northwestern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Business leaders, Indigenous business leaders gathered to discuss the opportunities. In the morning, we talked about supporting and unlocking communities in transition and surging, Mr. Speaker, as a result of uh, resource-based uh, activities and tourism. We also talked about opening Northern Ontario for international business, Mr. Speaker. We talked about the need for the province to maintain it and, and stay focused on reducing red tape for businesses, the modernized Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, and the Northern Energy Assistance Program, Mr. Speaker, to make sure we had that competitive advantage to compete. Uh, globally, Mr. Speaker. The good news is, is that we were very well received by these business leaders. We're looking forward Pons. to building out the kinds of projects, Mr. Speaker, that can complete an exciting supply chain that very much includes Northern Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. It is encouraging to hear about the programs that are being delivered through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund Corporation and that these are translating into real-world results for people and businesses across the North. While it is clear that many Northern communities that were forgotten under the previous Liberal government are now quite optimistic because of the meaningful investments made by our government. Yeah, yeah. Right? Our government must continue to do all that we can to work with our northern partners to foster innovation in order to build stronger and more prosperous communities. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is continuing to support economic development in communities across the north? Minister of Northern Development. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The second part of our day uh, evolved around more focused discussion. I was delighted to be joined by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and my very capable parliamentary assistant, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacoke, and Mr. Speaker. We talked about forest sector growth, the changing landscape, new owners of some of the major assets, and an increasing uh, ownership by Indigenous uh, communities and or their business in the forest sector. I mentioned it was a bright, sunny day. It turned partly cloudy, Mr. Speaker, because I chaired the, sec the, the discussion on processing and refining of our critical minerals in Northern Ontario. And I had to tell the folks at the table, Mr. Speaker, uh, about the recent vote here in the legislature and the lack of support from the NDP for mining, which means uh, processing in, in northern Ontario, northwestern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, uh, it only means one thing, that NDP stands for not doing processing, Mr. Speaker. What an incredible opportunity is done. Order. 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 The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Our communities are searching every day for missing, vulnerable loved ones here in Ontario. Children, youth, adults, and seniors who, when they go missing, do not meet the Amber Alert criteria, including Nathan, a 37-year-old man with Down syndrome who has now been missing for 19 days from Toronto. Oh. Over two months ago, my private member's bill, Bill 74, Missing Persons Amendment Act, was discharged and referred to committee. Speaker, through you, I ask the Premier, why are you not bringing back Bill 74 and providing another resource for police to use while searching for a missing and vulnerable loved one who may still be close to home? Government House Leader. Uh, the member frankly knows that uh, the bill was discharged uh, directly to committee so that we could uh, uh, make improvements to the bill. The member also knows, because the member was in the House, uh, that uh, we passed a motion uh, uh, earlier this week that authorized uh, committees to uh, do their work over the summer, which would include the member's bill. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Bill 74 fills a gap in our current emergency alert system, a solution that several municipal councils, stakeholders and groups who support vulnerable persons have agreed to, a tool for the police to use that is local and regional. A missing person may be the last person you rode the bus with or passed on the sidewalk. They're scared, confused, and not far from home. The same missing persons who, if a local alert was sounded, you may recognize immediately and report. Speaker, again, will the Premier do the right th thing and bring Bill 74 back to the table? Government House Leader. Speaker, uh, the, the member opposite is a whip in the NDP and knows full well that a motion was brought to this chamber, which was passed unanimously by everybody in the chamber, including Order. the member opposite, Order. which explained that committees would be meeting over the, sum, uh, over the summer, specifically the committee that that bill was referred to, and that it would be dealing with the bill over the summer. The member is aware of that. Order. In fact, I spoke to the family when they were here. The member Order. is aware of that. We have talked directly about it, that we would be dealing with this bill because of the importance and because of the flaws that were in the bill. The member, to my understanding, agrees with that. The whole House agrees with it. I'm uncertain what confusion there is. So again, the whole House voted unanimously Response. to bring back committees over the summer because, as you know, on this side of the House, we are constantly working on behalf of the people of the province of Ontario, and we will continue to do that over the summer. Yeah. Question. 
The member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. The agri-food sector in Ontario employs 750,000 people and is vital to our province's economic prosperity. In order for the agri-food sector to continue to grow and expand its markets, there must be a stable workforce to meet both current and future demands for services and products. That's why our government must continue to make investments that will strengthen competitiveness, innovation and resiliency within the agriculture, agri-food and agri-based industries. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to build up the workforce in the agri-food sector? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, the question from the member from Carleton, because I am very proudly standing in this house to say that our government is planning today for the future jobs of tomorrow, and that includes our agri-food sector. And through our Grow Ontario strategy, over the next 10 years, we have set a target to grow employment in our agri-food sector by 10 per cent. And a key to attracting people is pulling them in and making them aware of the amazing jobs our sector has at a young age. And that's why the 4-H program in Ontario is so, so important. And I had the pleasure just last week to, to share with people across this province how our government is continuing to invest in agricultural leadership development. And uh, one way is through the Sustainable Canadian Agricultural Partnership Program, whereby we're investing $2.3 million over the next three years in Ontario 4-H. And that is continuity and, and certainty for this program as they expose young people to the amazing opportunities in careers in the agri-food sector. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. This funding announcement demonstrates our government's commitment to fostering the conditions for continued growth in this vital sector, which is also great news for Ontario's youth and for 4-H Ontario. I've had the pleasure of meeting my local 4-H ambassador, Rihanna, and learning about the opportunities that 4-H provides to youth across our province in promoting the many aspects of agriculture. Programs through 4-H Ontario are designed to help young people like Rihanna Gallagher find a place they can be involved, accepted, valued, and heard while developing valuable leadership skills. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how this investment made by our government will help young people in Ontario prepare for careers in the agri-food sector? Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Culture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you, Speaker. And, and I remember meeting Rihanna at the Farmer's Breakfast in Carleton that the member opposite hosted earlier this year, and she's a shining example of how young people graduating through the 4-H program truly learn to do by doing, and they apply their head, heart, health, and hands to everything they do. And the funding that we announced last week is our renewed commitment to making sure that a youth program that is valued so much, and I know with confidence the Dairy Farmers of Ontario can attest to the quality of people that come through this program, uh, we'll and they'll see the return on the investment. Because we're going to be supporting local initiatives that increase awareness of careers in agriculture, we're engaging diverse communities through this program, and we are ensuring that the four jobs that are waiting for every one individual graduating from agriculture Response. or a food service program will have jobs available to them. This funding will benefit the already 6,000 4-H members and young people wanting to work in the agri-food sector in Ontario. Great, Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. A year ago, the Minister of Labour promised to raise WSIB income replacement rates to 90 per cent of pre-injury wages. This increase has not taken place. Then the WSIB cut the cost of living allowance for injured workers by a further 2 per cent. While cutting benefits and creating new red tape for injured workers to wade through, the government then took $1.2 billion out of the fund and gave it back to their corporate buddies. That's shameful. And now they've commissioned a report to say that the time to appeal WSIB decisions should be cut to one month. An injury at work has thrown your life completely upside down, yeah. and now the government is telling you that if you want the compensation to which you're entitled and which your family needs, you're going to have a month to appeal a bad WSIB decision. The Ontario NDP believes that no worker should ever be unjustly denied access to WSIB. 
Does Question. the minister share that commitment, or will he be cutting the time to appeal WSIB claims? Mr. Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Mr. Speaker, first I want to thank uh, all of those hardworking men and women that work for the WSIB that are there uh, every single day uh, helping those injured workers uh, across the province. They do uh, great work uh, everywhere in all of our communities. But, Mr. Speaker, it was only a decade ago that the WSIB was on the brink of bankruptcy. Under the leadership of Premier Ford and this government, we brought in new leadership, uh, a new board of directors, a new chair of the board, a new leadership at the WSIB to build a better system for workers and employers. And Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the changes that we've made in our recent Working for Workers 3 legislation, truly historic legislation. We're expanding pancreatic and thyroid cancer uh, to presumptive coverage to firefighters across the province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is going to help every firefighter, whether they're full-time, volunteer, First Nations firefighters, and Mr. Speaker, we're making it retroactive to January 1st, sure. 1960. A supplementary question. This government continues to do everything it possibly can to undermine the well-being of injured workers. Yes. Ontario's tribunal system is broken. Order. There are huge delays. It's difficult to navigate, and it's hard to find legal assistance. And yet, when workers make it through the system, a lot of them are finding justice. Claims that have previously been denied are being approved on appeal, and it's completely life-changing. Well, it seems that the government wants to take even that hope away from people by cutting the time for appeals. Shameful. Workers deserve justice. It's the right thing to do. But when WSIB is not there for workers, guess who pays? The public. Right. Will the minister do the right thing and commit not to cut the appeal time for WSIB claims? Minister of Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that this year injured workers in Ontario got a historic uh, pay increase, and we're going to continue uh, to build a, a better system for injured workers and employers, Mr. Speaker. That's why we brought in new leadership at the WSIB to fix the mess that the former Liberal government left. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, it wasn't that many years ago Order. that the whole system was on the brink of bankruptcy. We need a system that's going to be there for injured workers. And, Mr. Speaker, there is no government in literally a generation that's done more for workers across this province than Premier Ford and the PC government. We brought forward three historic, game-changing pieces of legislation, Working for Workers 1, Order. Working for Workers 2, and Working for Workers 3. And, Mr. Speaker, Order. we're not done yet. More to come. Great answer, man. The next question. A member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Ontario's diversity is one of our greatest strengths, with people from all backgrounds, faiths, and walks of life. All people in Ontario deserve to be respected, no matter where they come from, what they believe, or how they worship. Unfortunately, we are not immune to the rise of incidents of hate and intolerance that are, we are witnessing across Canada and, indeed, around the world. Acts of discrimination, hatred and violence have no place in our communities, and that is why our government must take action to implement measures that will combat hate and will protect the people of our province. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is building safer, stronger, and more inclusive communities. Thank you. Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank uh, the member from Brantford Brant for the question, and it is a very important question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important for all of us in this House to be very clear that hate and intolerance has no place here in Ontario. Here, here. Speaker, every, every Ontarian no matter their ethnicity or nationality, how they worship or who they love, deserves to live in safe communities and without fear that they may be targeted because of who they are. Mr. Speaker, that is why our government over the last two years has invested over $100 million to combat hate and help foster inclusive communities. 
Recently, Mr. Speaker, our government has announced $25.5 million to help protect Ontario's religious, diverse, and other marginalized communities. This funding will help ensure that they have safe and secure places uh, to practice their faith, showcase Response. their culture, and express who they are. Our government will always be a champion for all Ontarians. We will continue working to build a stronger, safer, and more inclusive for all people from all walks of life. Yeah, the supplementary question. Wait for the light. There it is. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. It's reassuring that our government is taking meaningful action to protect our communities and to combat hate wherever it exists. All Ontarians deserve to feel safe in their communities and should be able to live and worship without fear that they will be targeted. Communities in my home region of Brantford Brant are similar to other places across Ontario where there are people from a wide variety of faiths, beliefs, and backgrounds. The people of Ontario expect that our government will continue to put measures in place that will protect their safety and security. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the scope of the anti-hate security and prevention grant and how this will benefit organizations across Ontario? Thank you. The minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, again, I'd like to thank uh, the member for the follow-up question. I think building on our investment to combat racism and hate, the new $25.5 million anti-hate security and prevention grant will help create stronger, safer, and more inclusive communities, Mr. Speaker. We have expanded eligibility after much consultation to include more groups and organizations because, Speaker, everyone deserves to feel safe in the environment, to practice their faith, and express their cultures and beliefs. This investment will make a difference in helping thousands of more organizations across the province better protect their facilities from hate-motivated incidents, vandalism, and other acts of intolerance. Mr. Speaker, this includes religious organizations such as churches, mosques, synagogues, um, as well as cultural organizations um, that serve Black, Indigenous, Asian, 2SLGBTQI communities uh, who are all Boss. eligible. They can benefit uh, from these funds how they would like to invest it uh, most, uh, that will have the most. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, this government's plan to build on the Greenbelt is very alarming. Um, in a letter I received from the Federal Minister of the Environment, Minister Guibo, concerning your actions on the Greenbelt, um, he writes in part, There are portions of Ontario's Greenbelt that contain critical habitat for species listed under the Federal Species at Risk Act. Order. Environment and Climate Change Canada officials have reached out to the government of Ontario officials to ensure that the provincial and federal laws designed to support the identification, protection and mitigation of harm to species at risk and their habitats of concern are respected in the provincial approach to housing. So my question is very simple, and I ask it on behalf of so many Ontarians that are very concerned with your government's approach to housing. Um, what steps are you actually taking to protect species at risk as you rush to pave over wetlands, agricultural lands, and the question. Green Belt? Remind the members to make the comments through the chair. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing can reply. Uh, it appears, uh, Speaker, that uh, just, just like there is in the federal house, it appears there's a bit of a Liberal NDP alliance here in question period this morning, provincially. Um, you know, we've been crystal clear. We, we took a, a plan to the people uh, last June under the leadership of Premier Ford that our government would build upon our success with our housing supply action plans and not only have a housing supply action plan each and every year under a re-elected uh, government uh, under Premier Ford's leadership, but that we would build 1.5 million homes by 2031. And every measure we put forward, whether it was more homes, more choice in 2019, more homes for everyone, more homes built faster, and now we have the Helping Home Buyers Protecting Tenants Act, New Democrats have, have not supported it. So, you know, we've said many times we, we want to work with the federal government. We've got a great relationship Spons. with the uh, with, uh, minister Hussein and the housing minister. Uh, not, uh, I don't have a relationship with Mr. Uh, Guibo, so I, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't speak to that. But, but we want to move forward, and I know at our upcoming provincial territorial meeting, we'll have more to say about how the federal government can support our government. 
And the supplementary question? The minister uh, may not have a relationship now with Minister Guibault, but I predict he will shortly, given their actions, because your government is opening up the Dufferin's Rouge Agricultural Preserve for Development. And in response to the removal of the protection uh, status in this ecologically sensitive area, the federal government has initiated a Rouge National Urban Park impact study in an area that the Premier described as a field full of weeds. There are 33 federally listed species at risk, including the much-beloved monarch butterfly, 49 bird species listed under the Migratory Birds Convention, and 14 streams with fish-bearing species. So with so much at stake, why are you risking federal intervention, and why are you further endangering our already vulnerable species, biodiversity, and our green spaces in this province? You know, you know, Speaker, um, the NDP talk a good game, but as I said in my opening uh, answer to the question, they, they don't put their voting record alongside of it. We're going to continue to stand up for Ontarians. We, earlier today, we had a young group, a young class group up there. This is what motivates our government, to ensure that those young people who want to have a, an opportunity to have housing close to where they grow up, for that senior who decides that at their stage of life they want to downsize, but there's nothing that's available in their price range where they've grown up and where they've raised their family. These are the people we're that our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, are standing up to. This, these are the people that we're going to ensure that by 2031 we're going to hit our housing targets, we're going to ensure that we have a plan and place that we build upon. Speaker, we've had, for the last two years, Response. we've had 30-year highs in terms of housing rates. We've had an all-time high when it comes to rental starts. The one consistent measure is NDP opposition yeah. to increasing houses. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. My my question is for the Attorney General. Uh, and, and crime doesn't just affect victims immediately following an incident. Trauma can negatively impact them for the rest of their lives, often requiring long-term support. The effects of traumatic events can have lifelong implications as well as the possibility of negatively affecting their families and larger communities. It's imperative that our government stands up for victims of crime, not only through promoting public safety, but also by providing them with the support that they need. There are many heroic individuals and organizations throughout Ontario that provide support to those who have been victimized. Their dedication, advocacy and leadership make a positive difference in the lives of those that they are helping. Speaker, can the Attorney General, uh, the Attorney General please share with us uh, how we recognize these individuals and organizations that support people who have faced victimization due to crime. Great question. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my friend and colleague from Brampton North for his support of, of victims and organization, victim services and organizations from around Ontario. We uh, recently had a, an event and we had colleagues from all parties there uh, to celebrate the individuals and the, and the groups that are supporting victims of crime. Uh, vic people have their own personal experiences and sometimes that motivates them to increase awareness. And I want to focus on just one today who happens to be in the gallery. I introduced them earlier, Susan Centre for Grieving Children. They're for over 25 years, Mr. Speaker. For over 25 years, with no government funding, they have provided services for children between the ages of 5 to 24 who have experienced the death of a parent or a sibling, Mr. Speaker. It's exactly those type of people and those types of organizations that deserve the Victims' Awards uh, that they've been bestowed with. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.